Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to sixth webinar of Resource Scholars Forum on post PhD career opportunities. Uh, so I especially welcome Professor Mithun Chaudhary with us. Uh, so we really appreciate having you here in, in our webinar. Your your presence means a lot to us. So before I uh, give a brief introduction of Professor Chaudhary and uh, hand it over to him. I would uh, request um, everyone present here to please uh, mute your microphones and videos. Otherwise, it gets very distracting for the speaker. Uh, and uh, once uh, the speaker is done with his presentation, you can uh, either address your questions in the chat box uh, or uh, you can raise your hand. In that case, uh, we'll unmute your videos and you can directly ask your questions to the speaker or you can uh, write your questions in the chat box and we will direct uh, the questions to the speaker so uh, now i'll give a short introduction of uh, professor so professor uh, Chaudhary is an assistant professor at the department of metallurgical engineering and material science at Bombay. Uh, so he completed his MSc in chemistry from the University of Calcutta in 2008. He completed his uh, PhD in physics from the University of Freiburg, Germany in 2012. And his postdoctoral research from Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, and the University of St. Andrews, UK. Uh, so uh, we'll be learning about the post uh, of the post PhD career opportunities that's uh, available in academia and uh, also in industries from Professor Jodhuri. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. And am I audible? I guess. Uh, so thanks again for the introduction. Uh, I'll go on the slide share and also subsequently close my camera. Because it's probably better for few of you uh, with some problem bandwidth. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, but I just want to add on something on top of that. So I joined here right before coming from Princeton. I was there about two years. So this is also sort of a um, glorified postdoc, they call it the associate research scholar. So that says that I have quite a lot of post PhD experience. And uh, of course, uh, there are reasons for that. And I guess this is the right place to talk because I think just two years before I joined here and before that, maybe a few months from that time, I was used to ask something like that, although not only just post PhD about some uh, faculty search and other things. So going into that, uh, I'm just going into my screen sharing and stopping my camera. So I hope I'm still audible and that screen is shared properly. Uh, okay, so I call it like, a, then is that, is there any way we can drag this thing? I'm always getting this waiting room notification at the center. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, please ignore the waiting notification. Okay, so okay, that's fine. Them. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So we'll so keep adding that. people as we join. Perfect, perfect. So I call it uh, navigating post PhD career opportunities, and uh, in that case, uh, yeah. Although I, even the notification coming at the center, and maybe I will miss a little bit of a couple of lines. But yeah. So the questions. Uh, you probably when I got the mail from Jadupati, there was a bit. Uh, they have a few set of questions. Uh, I will try to gradually address those one by one. Uh, but yeah, a general question uh, that what do people do after completing their PhD? Uh, I mean, I just got this question by doing online searching. So someone put that question. Is it easy to get a job or become a faculty member? What are the other prospects? I just finished an UG and I got a corporate job, but I, I'd I would like to love to do a PhD in some discipline. So the answer is actually pretty cool and fast. So uh, 
it's actually easy to get a job with a technical PhD. And of course, the pay will be higher than with a master degree. However, the thing is a little tricky because for each hundred PhDs are produced, there are maybe only one and two faculty opening. That's the world scenario I am telling. And country to country, that changes a little. So that means there is a fierce competition for the slots. And also, if you are going to academia, that means uh, the city. Uh, is there someone trying to talk? Okay, that's fine. So if you're on the trying to go to academy, you're probably taking also a little tall task, but not something very uh, unnatural, because otherwise, how you guys enter in this thing? So in that sense, if you are going to academia, you are asking me the question about academia. Uh, I recently crossed the bar, so I certainly know a few things which I can pass. Uh, and if you want to go to industry, uh, I would say that I never thought of going there. But of course, uh, I know people uh, uh, who are working there and they are my friends or something like that. So I certainly have some ideas, but uh, I must say not as clear as academia. And there is a number you can see, 61 is to one. So you probably, I'll tell you by the end of this thing, if I forgot, just try to remind me what that number means. Uh, but yeah, certainly academia industry are not the only two options, but certainly these two are mainstream. And also you can think about uh, these government jobs and other. So here is the question list which I got uh, from uh, RSA. So, I mean, not certainly that they are asking to answer me all these things, but these are the set of, uh, I think, very pertinent questions uh, one should ask here in the present context where you are doing your PhDs. And I will gradually try to come on to them one by one. Uh, so let's say this slide is actually I used to show before even anyone start PhD. So I guess you guys are already senior PhD students or maybe even someone completed it. So still may be a little relevant if you are at the early stage that actually there should be a purpose for PhD as well. It's not just a degree. So whenever someone try to join a PhD, I just give them this set of questions that what is the motivation? Do you really need it? I mean, first question may look a little bit disheartening. I mean, someone is trying to do a PhD and I'm, am I asking, uh, do you really need it? But if you have this answer clearly, you certainly can utilize your PhD properly. It's not just another thing. And of course, whatever you will get out of it, you will know that by the end of the talk. So yeah, you need these things in your mind when you are doing a PhD. So realistically about your job prospect, workload, pressure. Pressure is not like that someone is forcing you to work in the lab for 20 hours, it's something else. Pressure comes uh, by every way, as long as you are not trying to do it as it should be done. Uh, and it's not by someone, it's actually within yourself. And I always say that PhD is an extremely passionate journey but it is focused. And in this whole time, you have, to be, you have to stay composed and organized. So it's a tall task, but of course uh, it's possible. Uh, I mean, PhDs are possible in many ways, but doing a perfect PhD of course needs some extra bit of uh, organization. I don't, I don't tell it extra bit of time or effort, but it's organized effort. So going into the next slide, uh, since uh, there are the first question, the list of renowned scholarship and engineering sciences. Uh, I am, of course, I will tell about it, but the best answer would be GFY, means go find yourself. I'm not trying to be rude. The reason is that when you are trying to find it, you will find many things. And this one of the agenda of this job is that you have to search anything, whether it's a nice recipe or you are trying to find a travel plan in some country. So it's always a good idea to be inquisitive and find find anything because now you have internet i mean when i you guys started in our bachelors uh, we didn't have much access to computer coming from university background in a humble economical background so now this is not the case uh, everyone has this information in their hand so just google it and find it and the reason is that of course you find your information and you also find something extra that will help so I also say that better to join a renowned research group than chasing a renowned scholarship, uh, which 
it, it is available both at once. I mean, scholarship and an nice group, then of course go for it. And another thing you have to keep in mind, scholarships needs proper preparation time. Yeah. So it's not something like you just write a mail and go there it, because there is a funding agency. You have to reach the host. I mean, your future boss before. Uh, then you have to agree on the, on some plan. You have to plan the research proposal. Then you have to reach the scholarship organization. You have to put the application together. So I say that it's it's at least a half an year to one year long job. Uh, one thing is that for your first postdoc, maybe it's a good way to think. But I found that when you are, let's say, when you finish your postdocs and you're already in a first postdoc, it's tough to keep track on time on applying all those things and switch career one by one because uh, it needs a bit of time. But of course, if you have that much plan, uh, go ahead and go, go ahead for some uh, nice uh, fellowships with nice names. Uh, of course, there are some names I can refer and you can also find it uh, from your internet search as well. So in the US, there are like Rhodes, Fulbright, uh, uh, TWS, Connect, Connacyt, and in UK, you have Newton, Lever, Holman. So these are lists. So top row is for the US ones, uh, second row starting from Newton to Rutherford, these all are mainly UK based. The Europe base, there are like uh, AVH, Alexander von Amboldt, Marie Curie, Dad, George Foster, you know, they are uh, in all the scientific organizations in those foreign countries like Germany, Switzerland, France, even Ireland, UK, they all have their scientific organizations. They all have some fellowships. You just have to Google those names and find out what the fellowships is going on. And another thing is that every notable university have some prestigious named for the fellowships. Counted from Princeton, Ivy Leagues, Harvard, to even any little more than average universities, they all have some. You find some endowments, you find some grants, and some in, uh, some named fellowships which you can apply. Yeah, but the reality is the most postdoc positions are given by a normal non permanent job announcement, uh, and of course that's why you need to have a look into those job announcement and that there should be a single place which can also cater around all those fellowships announcement and jobs announcement. Uh, there are very few good pages, uh, not many I am saying, because you can lot of, if you just Google, you get a lot of pages, but uh, I'm not saying all are crap, but there are very few pages where things are very nicely collected and any good important job uh, will not be missed by at least big pages like higher ed jobs in US or your access in Europe or jobs.ac.uk in UK. So jobs.ac.uk is a certainly a website which is actually, they are legally bound to give a job advertisement in United Kingdom uh, into this website before they give the job to anyone. So basically every job is there, every academic job is there. And of course there are other ones like neuroscience, German ones, there is one in French one, but you have to know you the French for that because most of the book comes in the French language. So you can have a look into these things if you are regarding that later. So these are, I think, uh, quite helpful job sites. Uh, there are a couple of good links you can see uh, about scholarship positions, especially for the uh, Indian students. And in, also in Harvard, you can also find some general links about postdoc opportunities. Just have a look into them. And uh, because I think these, these web pages are genuine, I'm not advertising for them, but from my experiences, I found they are genuine enough to look into it. So uh, what I would say that, uh, but how these things actually do happen? So the second questions and third questions, uh, RSF was uh, bringing the uh, email. They, they put that uh, requirements to get a PhD position, postdoc positions and how to approach a supervisor for postdoc position. And then again, I will come back again to the very early question. Why do you need a postdoc position? Because your lab senior did that, or you can travel and live in a cool place, or you need a foreign passport to stay in some foreign country forever. I'm sure none of, one, none of you are looking like these in this way. These are little negative ways to look into the problem. But I would suggest that postdoc is of course not a career. I mean, if you think that, you are doing a postdoc and you are done, then you are wrong. 
because postdoc is just a career transitioning stage, which is actually uh, gives uh, some good experience to a skilled scientist. Once you have the PhD, you have you are already a skilled scientist who are very familiar with lab work. But now postdoc will give you some opportunity, some greater independence. Uh, I always found that nicer the place that more and more the independence is. In Princeton, I met my uh, advisor in my whole two years uh, regarding scientific discussion. It's not more than, I guess, 10, 10, 10 times or something like that. The reason is that once you are so advanced, they know and they can depend on you. So they give you some liberty so that you can arrange your fund, you can arrange your research, even you can guide some students as well, formally or even informally. Even formally is also possible. So the thing I like to try to say is that postdoc is not just another super, supervised lab research experience. It's an experience where, of course, you can learn things from many people, not from your supervisor only, from your friends, from your colleagues, from your acquaintances, from your network. But I think these postdoc positions are more focused in a way that it's actually a training place for future academicians. Nowadays, there are a lot of industry-based postdocs, uh, but uh, there is a goal for that. But if there is, I mean, industry academia partnership kind of postdocs, that makes a lot of sense. But if there is any postdoc position only industry, you have to be a little more judicious to look into the job description. Because, uh, of course, you can, of course, switch to uh, industry after your PhD. Then you are not doing any postdoc. And I suggest that that's a good choice. Because as much as you uh, arrange or as much as you accumulate your postdoc experience after PhD, you are actually going far from industry that much. Because people in industry will think that you are a confused guy uh, who probably couldn't break the academia and you wanted to be in academia for long. And at the end, you are giving up and leaving the postdoc and trying to go to join uh, an industry. So I suggest don't think PhD is only for do going to be a professor because you are blocking under a professor. PhDs are for many, many aspects. I will show you later. But keep in mind that if you are determined that you want to go to industry, I think switch right after PhD. That's my personal opinion, but a lot of people agreed on that. And if you think you are an academia, you want to be in academia, I mean, that was uh, my choice. I mean, I can even tell you later that I only had one choice because I never thought anything other than else. Uh, so now I can even tell you about what the 61 is to one. I apply at 61 academia places and one industry places. I will again come into that. And I will also tell you that you have, you should have to be flexible on these things. Okay. So, one question was that, uh, how to approach the supervisor? But the first thing I would say that, although this is a business line, try to have uh, try to listen to me. So who is actually your postdoc supervisor? It's not something like that you are writing a random email, dear professor, someone, or dear professor in general, I want to do a job in your lab. That is not going to work. Uh, if it is work, then that the lab is not good. So basically that your future postdoc boss is already filled many numbers in your reference list in your paper or your thesis. So basically you know him quite nicely. Maybe you haven't met personally, but you know him quite or him or her quite nicely uh, because of their work. You read their work, you appreciated their work, you are using their work in your uh, research, you are referencing them. So it's basically you are in the community of the same community where your own supervisor belongs. So Quite likely, probably he knows your work, means you are doing some important and relevant work. If not the case, maybe your PhD supervisor lab has good hold on that area. So that person know that, okay, there is a group exist who works in this area. And if some student is coming from the lab, they are probably have some good work in the pipeline. So this is one of these things. And as I say that, uh, probably you probably could get a chance to meet your future postdoc supervisor somewhere in a meeting and have some chat. And as I say that a good postdoc is a no less than an early career faculty. And a senior PhD student is no less than a postdoc in a new lab. So basically you can see how the difference is between their faculty 
a early career faculty, a postdoc, and a PhD. It's very thin difference. Only thing is that, of course, there is a big difference in terms of job uh, job positions and the transition between these two uh, career stage. But in terms of skill, skills, I think they are pretty comparable as much as they are organized at their own level. So what you do in this case normally, you should write a, I mean, provided you are not going through a fellowship and writing an email, you should write a short and crisp email uh, and then put a two, three page uh, email attachment and CV. And there is no personal details is important. Uh, it, they don't need your uh, actually from where you belong or which is your home address, what is your parents name, your blood group, nothing required. Your hobby, you like to play cricket, it doesn't matter. So you just put what the need, uh, which is basically the your degrees, your abstract of thesis project, list of skill set you have, list of publications, which is the most important thing, and of course references. And when you're writing the mail, write dear professor and write his full name or that surname. Don't copy paste it because uh, often from where you are copy paste and the font you are writing in email, they are different. And when sometimes people be so skeptical that they will think that this guy is not giving that much effort to type my name, and that happens. So type the name of the person. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone is that much picky. And then try to write not a generic mail, just that why you are writing to him, why do you think your research project or your research experience is suitable for his or her lab, and how can you contribute? Yeah. And it's a good idea that make your own web page. And nowadays, uh, putting all this thing in an email and attaching a CV always is uh, not even a good idea because attachments could get lost. Sometimes people will never read an attachment which is not in PDF. Uh, Docx, uh, words, these all uh, source files, a lot of people don't read or even a lot of servers just reject it out because of the safety concern. So the best idea is that make your web page and put a link. Uh, that will surely work. Uh, so I'll try, of course, these things I can always discuss back again when you are asking questions. So what I'm just trying to go into the next questions, which I also find in the RSF list. So major challenges being faced in different countries for Indians. It looks like a generic, generic question. So I would say, and it's more on the social side, I would say that nothing as long as you are willing to accept rules and try to make yourself comfortable to accept changes in every way, in lab or in life. Uh, some people also get worried about uh, languages. I will tell you that your working language is always English, but uh, once you are in Europe or in a nice country, I think it's a good idea to learn the local language to interact with the locals. It's not necessary, you'll always talk with your supervisor and lab mates and office mates. Uh, you should also need some time after your uh, work. Uh, and of course, uh, you can get every amenities and everything is there. And nowadays, actually, yeah, I mean, internet made everyone close. So basically, you can now figure out what is available in a grocery store in some country in your, that is also possible to know from Mumbai. So that's not a big deal. Uh, provisions to live with family in foreign countries, uh, of course, when you are doing postdocs uh, or even PhD, every country will allow your immediate family but there are no issues there. Uh, but uh, there are many things to plan, I guess you all know, time, uh, many paperwork. Uh, so I think use internet, careers, uh, these kind of things judiciously before you go there. And I think it's a good idea to plan a family a little later if it is possible. Uh, because, uh, yeah, it takes some time to get organized in a new country. And also, from the experience side, I would say there is nothing like finding yourself alone in a new country and the new city at day zero. Because they, then there will be a lot of things which is not in place, a lot of paperwork to organize. That is actually his experience to set up in a new country in a new day. It's not less than organizing a new thing. Maybe that experience is helpful for organizing a new lab or anything. I mean, that's a big experience and I, I did that thrice in my life. So uh, that is actually an essential step and I encourage people have to take this experience in life. Okay, so now coming to more on the technical sides. So 
finding job opening versus finding an employee. So two sides. So from your side, you will be looking into networking, uh, meeting people in professional organizations and conferences, try to look into the job boards, which I already mentioned, those are actually some job boards, announcement, look into the pages of institutes and companies, uh, look into the journals, professional and scholarly journals, uh, into the career fairs. Now, since uh, journals is coming, although it's not related into the directly in your career aspect, but I would like to tell that you have to be very, very careful to know which journal is actual, because there are a lot of predatory and sort of fake journals nowadays, and they can send nice random emails to you, maybe even telling you, dear Professor X, Y, Z, but be careful and always try to ask seniors or even supervisors to know which journal is uh, good and which society is a legit because uh, once you are in touch with a non-legit society basically even if you're a good guy there is some sort of scientific stigma uh, as will be associated with you those who know you yeah so be careful to be in association i'm not saying social association in your institute or friends or with other institutes they are all legit but don't just be lured uh, by a random email uh, because uh, that could be a little dangerous. So, uh, someone raised hand. I, are they can talk in between or we have to wait until the end? Uh, sir, we can take, take the question uh, at the last talk. Like, okay, when the talk is over, we can take that. And, and can you tell me how much time I have already passed? Uh, you have time. Okay, I have you time. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So these are the bad thoughts in the lab is from your aspect as a candidate. But if you look into the employer aspect, what they look for, they try to find the candidate uh, from within. Within means their circle. This is not something like a uh, immoral practice. It's because like dependence. No? I mean, from a friend or colleague. Let's say I am a I'm going to take a postdoc uh, and I know uh, one of my colleagues is working in any country uh, who, who has some students and this guy can vouch for that guy where the references come. Then of course, uh, there is nothing wrong to go with that guy provided the guy is well qualified. And here also comes not that if someone gives you a good reference, that's not enough. You have to also show in other way. That is your, uh, let's say, if you are going for academic program, that is your publication list. Until and unless you have a publication, if someone gives you a good recommendation, it hardly helps, uh, provided uh, uh, the referee can convince that there are some really nice work in the pipeline. And the other way people look for these people uh, for postdoc and other jobs, like use an agency, using an ad, and also using an unsolicited resume, which is basically the random emails you are doing, and from job board. So the best chance is, of course, in the both side is uh, networking from the network, from the colleagues, from the community. So that's why I always say that once you are a PhD student, build a community. I'm not saying making a lobby and something like this. I mean, it's a community means, let's say you're working in some area. So there are a lot of people working in this thing. So when you are look at reading a paper of these people, just don't look into the names and the abstract and the uh, material in the paper only. Just go into the names, see who are they, which are the people they work with, uh, where they do travel, uh, which conferences they do go. That's how you. That's how you make a community. Now. I mean, that's how you feel interested in anything as well. Like, let's say there are people probably in India. A lot of people they are interested about maybe some uh, movie stars. They try to follow these guys. They try to follow their Twitter handles where they travel. Uh, okay, so that's why it's always a good idea to follow uh, people uh, or the future uh, uh, colleagues who want to work or future supervisors. Try to find their their network, the area they work, the pool of people they work, the pool of conferences they go, what kind of area they do. Work. So just like you feel that you belong to that community, yeah. And for 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 sure that just looking into them will not make the thing until and unless you show them that you also belong there. 
and that is not going to happen just by calling them and reaching them look i am good no that's not the way you have to show that also by your research okay uh okay so another question was that opportunities for phds in the government sector academic field and industry so as i said yes these are uh, major three sectors but there are actually way more uh, if you know that that will be suitable for you because you need a job which is a proper job for you uh, if you don't enjoy a job then it's actually not a job i mean you can go into it and then probably you get exhausted and then leave and change the job at some point so industry government sector academia all has options to work as researchers but the job descriptions really really vary let's say in academia you are a completely independent researcher you set your goal you manage your lab uh, and when you are like a group leader uh, like us or principal investigator but in government sector also there are like research labs csr labs and different other labs where of course you are can be independent but you can also work under some uh, uh, leaders group leaders and try to follow the agenda of the lab in industry the research is actually little bit different all the different depends on the industry the industry uh, there is also apart from uh, your curiosity driven research there is also economy is a matter you cannot just research anything which is not uh, that much relevant uh, from the economical point of view of the industry however in early days in us uh, there are some good industries uh, uh, they used to give lot they used to provide a lot of money to do even curiosity driven research Uh, i cannot tell their names but because they are actually changing time by time but there are very good uh, research organizations who are also in industry like xerox was there at some point bell lab was there in early days who, who which is now at and t uh, intel at some point used to do good research and they have now fab nice fab uh, fabrication facilities but they have quite a good amount of job pools they have lot of jobs there are a lot of startups and smaller companies uh, they are actually doing really good and giving a lot of liberty to their employees 